Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this, uh, I think, next to last session today. Um, and as a lead up to the artist Christo, we have um, a, a brief moment with uh, Jorge Manias Rubio and Amanda Pinati. These are two imaginative individuals who decided to create a mobile museum of design in what is commonly described as a slum. Now, Daravi is in Mumbai and uh, houses mainly, uh, sorry, as many as one million people in three square kilometers. Uh, when Jorge first visited the place some five years ago, he was very much stunned. He realized that Daravi was actually a city in and of itself and that it had more than 20,000 mini factories or micro factories within it and that there were people working with laser cutting machines. There were plenty of goods being produced. There was plenty of creativity in this place. And so the image that we have of the slum as a place of poverty and misery and possibly um, dirt was something that really was not what he was perceiving. And so he came back to Amsterdam, which is where they both live, and he decided to sort of start thinking with Amanda about what to do about this and to kind of get engaged with uh, the community in Daravi. And together they decided to set up a museum in a caravan right there in Daravi. I think they moved the caravan a couple of times. Uh, and the museum was there for about a year. And they, they decided to show design works but these were not works that had been brought from the West or from outside. These were works that had been made on the spot by artists and artisans and creative talents living in Dharavi. And so, uh, Jorge, what, what, what exactly did you show in this uh, mobile museum? I, I think we're seeing some images, but it would be nice to get you to uh, describe the contents. Yeah, um, we did several exhibitions when we were there, and then we left and our team continued to exhibit from cricket bats, to chai cups, uh, to brooms, uh, hand fans, parasols, uh, um, several items, uh, laptop cases, um, iPad cases, all sorts of different objects and products. And, and these, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> no worries. Sorry. Um, and these objects were um, kind of uh, decorated or adorned in some way. They were designer objects in some way. Yeah, well, our main purpose was to uh, first find uh, people who wanted to work with us and then uh, encourage, uh, you know, uh, some sort of experimentation. Uh, you have to think that uh, people who are living in the Ravi, mm -hmm. uh, even if they're designers or, or craftsmen or creative people, uh, because they are in the Ravi, they are automatically uh, translated into cheap, manual, repetitive labor. So we wanted to, to break that circle. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we decided to create objects that always, uh, you know, they address the local identity, the, the local community. So these objects... We're seeing some now, actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. these objects, the, a chai cup is a chai cup, a water filter is used for storing water, but they obviously, they have a different function. They have some intangible value. These objects are, are vehicles to, to convey that message and, you know, the spirit of these people, they're extremely hardworking and, and optimistic and we wanted to capture that spirit and that identity and, and celebrate it. Yeah. So, Amanda, you are obviously yes. part of the same project. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, what was the public reaction to this? I mean, who were the visitors to this caravan museum? Well, of course, we created this platform for the makers of the Ravi, because to show them, to give them actually a face, because these makers, they're like Jorge said, they're seen as cheap manual labor. So, they are sort of invisible. Um, so we really wanted to give them a platform so they could be recognized by their community but also by um, the city of Mumbai and actually the rest of the world. And the community itself was very proud to have its own museum. And um, because finally the Ravi came into the news as something positive instead of something negative. So mm -hmm. it was really celebrated um, in, the, in the media. And of course, so the community was very proud of it. And for the first time, people from Mumbai actually came to the Ravi. Because normally oh. they, they, you know, they go around it. The Ravi is really in the middle of Mumbai. And you know, there are ways to, to get to the other side of Mumbai. But normally, this is, by the way, the Ravi, if you see it on the map. Um, 
so they came to see our museum with their, with their own eyes because they actually couldn't believe that these objects were made in the Rafi, so that was uh, really interesting. So the, the remarkable thing is that you had an audience of um, peers, of, of peers of the people who had made the objects, but also an audience of, you know, folks from Mumbai. Yeah, so we had people city. from Mumbai, and we also, at one point, we organized a pottery workshop, and also students from universities in Mumbai, they came to us. Uh, Paola Antonelli also visited us. Mm -hmm. She's the curator of MoMA. And that was actually a funny story because she was overhearing one kid explaining our museum to another kid. She, yeah. And um, she told this to us and uh, the child actually said, um, this museum is like a magic show but without the tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. can you think of a better definition of uh, what a museum could be and in mm -hmm. the future, right? And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, did anyone question this initiative of yours? I believe that it costs something in the tens of thousands of euros, which is, of course, in the museum field or in the grand scheme of things, a small sum of money. But perhaps, I mean, did you have people kind of say, why are these two characters from Amsterdam <laughs> spending money on and putting a design museum in a caravan when they could be giving food or giving help or giving shelter or giving clothing? Or yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you did uh, get that. Yeah, and uh, you know we understand, but uh, like we said, we are from Amsterdam, and and we come from a design and art background. So uh, we decided to do this because we felt that this project could help not only local people, but you know the fact that we are here today speaking about this uh, about yeah. this neighborhood, and we hopefully we are changing our mentality. We we must not forget that in the future a quarter of humanity will live in homegrown neighborhoods like this. So the, the sooner we start recognizing this, these places and the sooner we start integrating these neighborhoods into our future cities, um, you know, the, the better. For us it was very interesting because we can completely reimagine what a museum can be in the future. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is very interesting. We keep on talking about those tricks that uh, Amanda was talking about. Uh, a museum, uh, you know, can be defined not only by architectural glamour, or can be defined not only by a famous collection, or by the number of thousands of uh, social media followers. It might have those, but the magic is not about that. So we wanted to strip the museum of that idea of, of privilege and elite, yeah. because we must not forget that museums are symbols of power and, and authority. And we envision a, a museum um, you know, where walls are, are transparent, walls are dissolvable. We envision a future museum that encourages a greater diversity, but not only in its program or its content, but in the, in the people that interact with this museum. And most importantly, we envision uh, a museum that will play a, a way more relevant social role in our, in our cities. That's the museum of the future. Mm -hmm. And um, Amanda, is this, uh, I think this museum is a template that you would like to replicate elsewhere. It's a model that you would like yes, to take. Yes, that's to correct. Yeah. Uh, on a meta level, we wanted to create a model that you can implement in uh, uh, different neighborhoods around the world, like similar neighborhoods. So we actually created this book, Design Museum the Rav 2016, and it has a manual where we compiled all the lessons that we've learned in the Ravi, and, um, and we really encourage people to read the manual and maybe uh, also set up a similar project. This project was open from day one and we really are open to collaborating. But so, I mean, are you actually going to take it someplace else? Is another city of the world going to host something like this or not um, yet? We're looking for partners right now. We're talking to people in Peru, for example. Peru. That would be very interesting to, uh, to not per se recreate or like copy this, this project, but mm -hmm. of course it's some sort of a bespoke uh, project there. Yeah. yeah, I see. Yeah, I see. And um, yeah, uh, you've won awards for this project, haven't you? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah yes. we were awarded best new museum of the year last year in Asia, which I think is, is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but, but again, it's, it's, you know, this is not an art project. This is not us as a curator, as an artist talking about this art project. This is a, a design project about the, the goods and the people that are, uh, you know, working in the Rabi. Sure, yeah. So why, 
in a city you have a concentration of 20,000 studios, micro factories, workshops, uh, you know, why that is not being supported? Why is that is not being celebrated in any other city that we've been talking about, Berlin, Paris, New York? Mm -hmm. That sort of, you know, uh, uh, energy would be supported, would be celebrated. So why not in any other city? Absolutely. Yeah. So Given I think this sorry. award really, um, well, gave us the recognition to tell us the story, and that's how we can give this, uh, well, a bigger platform, actually. Yeah. Mm. Given the enthusiastic clapping that I just heard, I presume that there might be some questions from the audience. So um, you're most welcome to ask. Um, we have a gentleman here. Could we please have a microphone? We also have a fuzzy microphone here in the front. So if that could be removed. Uh, hi, I'm from India. And I'm curious about how you s discovered Dharavi and um, what was your inner motivation mm -hmm. to get on with this project? Yeah. Um, well, the first time I visited Dharavi, I was working as a designer for a company. So that's how I managed to spend three weeks there. And that's where I met our advisors. Uh, Amanda and I, we didn't do this together alone. We had a, a, a group of people working in Dharavi that they call ERFs. And they were our advisors since day one. They're experts in architecture, in uh, urbanism, anthropologists. And they've been working in Dravi since, uh, I think, 10 years ago. Yeah, about 10 years. About yeah. 10 years ago. So uh, we first met, and we, we decided that we could do something together. Um, the idea basically came up because when you Google Dravi, when you do some research or watch some movies, you have this image or this portrait of almost a, a apocalyptic landscape uh, and it's also negative but uh, you know there are also stories of success and the stories of of resilience so we wanted to to portray those yeah. those stories and uh, when you go to the ravi there are there are hospitals there are police stations there are restaurants hotels gyms cinemas there are churches mosques uh, temples uh, but there was no museum so we told them why not create a museum together? And uh, four years later, we managed to go there and make it happen. Yeah. But to go back to the question, I mean, is there another question from the floor? I was just curious about uh, the segmentation of the, of the visitors. Um, could you keep, can it be a bit more, Jorge, tell me a bit more about who were the people who coming in? Um, well, we got... And how many people came? Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's really hard to say, yeah. but um, um, I mean, I would I would say um, at least a thousand in all the exhibitions, yeah. maybe a bit less. But mm -hmm. now you think about the diversity. The, the first exhibition was about the chai cups, the water filters that we made together with the potters, but also we uh, we presented broom makers. They are considered as the lower status in the Ravi, and potters actually the highest. So we just wanted to show them together to show that creativity can come from anywhere. And so we had those communities there. And then the second uh, exhibition was actually a cricket tournament. So we organized a cricket tournament. We had four local teams. And uh, that was really interesting. So, you know, you first have your water cups, your chai, your, you know, all that kind of stuff. So maybe a little bit of an older generation came. And the cricket tournament, we just had lots of youngsters cheering each other on. We had a whole day. We had a DJ there. Um, we had drinks and food. So it really was... Uh, a different sort of event, so it also attracted different kind of yeah. people. It was, it was interesting because in a museum you're never allowed to touch anything, everything is behind glass, but right. uh, on that day cricket bats were being broken apart and, and people were really using uh, the museum, so uh, we got visitors from, yeah, all over Mumbai, but also schools uh, from Europe who were visiting Mumbai, they were very interested in, in you know, going and visiting the museum and we still get uh, emails almost every day, yeah. people asking us, where is the museum, how much is the ticket entrance, uh, is there a shop, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, that's, yeah. that's probably our fault because yeah. we call it a museum and, and we wanted that. But that's that, the whole idea, to trigger people's minds, yeah. like this can also be a museum. In the end, yeah. what, is, what is a museum? You know, yeah. we, we, we can completely reimagine and redefine it and we thought that in Dharavi, that could, be, that could be something interesting because the idea of a museum doesn't exist there yet, not because yeah. it's not necessary. Okay, I, I kind of listening to you, sorry, I'll, I'll get to you 
right away, um, is I have a sense that you're kind of critical of the museums the way they exist today. And the, <laughs> the man who just Maybe. raised his Oops. <laughs> <laughs> the man who just raised his hand is a, and is about to ask a question is we the director yeah. of the Map Museum in Lisbon, for instance. So yeah. what's wrong with the museums the way they're being done, like not by you? Uh, well, <laughs> we don't want to say they're doing something wrong. Yeah. The thing is that we see that these beautiful museums, they attract people, but they always attract a certain kind of people. Right. And we actually want to touch the other people that, that won't be connected with the art that much. So we, that's why we actually did a design museum, not an art museum, mm. and went to the people. So that's why it's, it's also... mobile. Yeah, it's mobile, yeah. so we can interact with different yeah. communities, God. with we different keep, people. We keep wondering how to bring different people into our museums, but why mm. not bring in our museums to that people? Got it. Yeah. Pedro Gadagno of the MAP Museum in Lisbon. Thank you. I, I didn't exactly want to compare museums and their strategies <laughs> no, to no, potentially no. change the world, but I did want to point out to these uh, different perception of how you change the world, which I think is, has become very, uh, very relevant this morning, because if you speak of grand political gestures or grand projects like the European Union, you have a sort of attitude and you accept that transformation comes from a set of policies and so on. But I believe, and I believe that your work is part of that trend, that in a younger generation, uh, people again um, accept the idea that uh, what you could call micro, micro utopias are possible and are actually transformative at a very small scale and can be then replicated in different conditions. So it's a difference between the grand gesture that tends to over-dominate and tends to consider that only by moving masses you can change things, to another movement, which I think is really a radical change, and I would like to hear you about this position, uh, in which uh, people actually believe that small gestures added up can really transform uh, life for those who are not uh, sometimes considered in the grand gesture. Amanda, do you think that you are kind of on the cusp of a revolution in art, <laughs> art representation, art and design representation? Well, no, I wouldn't put it as a revo uh, revolution, but I, I totally agree that these small steps, they can lead to something different if you combine them all. And I think these sort of platforms, like that we are speaking here, that is like the big change, I think, that we get recognition with this project. And if we Im implement it in a different way, in different neighborhoods that that can create something mm. yeah. but so in peru for instance let's picture your next uh venture you said that there may be something uh, uh, coming out in peru well that's uh, well like very early, <laughs> early days yeah. okay very early well let's yeah. talk hypothetically what's the next caravan museum going to be like is it going to be similar to the one we've seen or? i don't i don't know but uh, i would like to you know pick up the thread of what you were saying yeah. about uh, micro utopias and and certainly uh, making a museum in a place like Doravi or any other homegrown neighborhood around the world is certainly a, a utopian uh, you know gesture but i we truly believe that in this utopian process you know first of all we can overcome our own limitations and second of all we can come up with uh, new social scenarios and that's that's what the, the this project is about maybe that's uh, you know that the artistic vision of this museum is, is is utopian spirit in in that in that sense in that way and we we feel that's relevant and as as uh, you know creative individuals living in Amsterdam we felt that our work was useful and that we felt that we could go there and actually, you know, come up with this project because we feel that it was, uh, you know, important not only for the local people in, in Dharabi, but for, you know, all over the world. We must really change the way we see these neighborhoods because... Yeah, uh, yes? Yeah, please, Robin. I just wonder about the sustainability of this model, which is very much idealistic and wonderful, but like what happens when the caravan leaves town? I mean, is there anything that's, that's permanent that remains behind? And how do you make sure that what you're creating is not just kind of this wonderful flash in the pan, but has some kind of lasting impact? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to start with that? Um, well. Well, the, the, the objects, they all remain within the community. So, uh, for example, we don't collect objects. All these objects 
remain within the community. We've worked with maybe how many? Uh, I think about we 50, 50 different uh, people in the Ravi from carpenters, architects. Um, yeah. So anything. Yeah. So it's very you know compared to one million people living there, you know, it's, it's pretty much nothing. We know it's a small gesture, uh, but you know we we think it's it's important in that sense. Um, we went all the way from Amsterdam there, and, and I understand that that creates a conflict, but the real change, you know, us and artists and curators, we get a support, and we got, uh, you know, the funding that you were talking about from Amsterdam to go there, and that's, you know, that's a really great support, but when this change happens, when this support is coming from inside, from the city of Mumbai, and they are supporting not us, but the designers and these creative people, then that change will have a, a different scale. We know that some producers, some of the potters we work with, uh, they introduce different uh, different products in their in their you know in their collections, and uh, they're yeah. you know changing uh, a little bit, um, exploring the idea of making objects that are a bit more precious that can have a, a higher value. Uh, but we didn't go there to tell them you know this is what design is or this is what you should do. It was just for us a learning experience of, uh, you know, a different vision for a future museum. Yeah, there's also the issue of uh, funding of culture. As we know, governments all across the board are cutting and cutting and cutting. Mm -hmm. Except, hopefully, uh, Her Excellency Sheikha Mayasa uh, contributing ever more to the funding of culture. But everywhere else, you know, it's just cut, cut, cut. And so what happens, you know, to projects like this? It seems to me that the projects like this are homegrown or grassroots sort of solutions to the fact that there's less investment in culture on the part of governments. Um, would you agree? Or? Uh, yeah, but I mean, in, in a, in a well, place... Yeah, we are also looking, of course, for other, other funding now because instead of us trying to find funding in the Netherlands again for this sort of project, actually uh, we're talking to private funding in, in India. Mm -hmm. Because of this uh, project, they see the, the potential that there, there is in the Rafi, so they come and talk to us to say, like, hey, maybe we can do something, and that's what is important. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. so yeah, yeah, creating, you know, that's, that's some form of sustainability, creating an appetite among private sponsors and funders to do this when you're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Pick up where you left off. Yeah. Do we have, yes, ma'am. I have another question in the room. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Katrine schultz -Bart, and um, it's probably in follow-up question to Robin. I mean, I see it from a different perspective, from you going there short term or short time um, do you actually see the sustainability in increasing those people's pride in what they're doing and the recognition of what they're doing and so therefore creating a business model for themselves and that in essence will then turn into sustainability and not just in those developing countries but perhaps in France and Germany in uh, Europe where we have uh, larger communities that have uh, a deprived self-worth because of they left most of their culture and their things behind. But now through those kinds of museums or other ways actually recognize their own heritage, their own capabilities and skills and make it a sustainable project because they make their own businesses out of that. Is that yeah. the sense you're getting from them? Exactly, that is what we wanted to do. We also had a, uh, we did a symposium in Amsterdam where we had uh -huh. different speakers and also someone said like, yeah, we actually, we don't have a design museum in the Netherlands and we have so much talent that's not being recognized. So, you know, we could also have a mobile design museum in Amsterdam, for example, or anywhere else in the Netherlands or, yeah. yeah. I think anywhere you go to a museum, doesn't matter where it is, you always see a, a same, you know, the same group of people with this, from the same background and, and uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are uh, left outside of this uh, of this beautiful thing, which is a museum, so we just you know trying to come up with uh, uh, different ideas and different ways, so everybody can feel welcome and and not uh, kind of uh, you know appalled by the idea of getting into a museum. And you know I think there's that sort of sense, and uh, that's what we try to do with uh, with our project and, and encouraging that bigger diversity of an audience, yep. but also of the makers. Yeah. Do we have any one final question? Yes, please. 
Hi, uh, I'm just wondering if, was, if there was any negative backlash with the community, and do you think it would have gotten the same attention if it was made by locals? Uh, I think your second question, probably not. Yeah. It probably got uh, a lot more attention because we were there doing the project. That's yeah. uh, something that uh, I think is... Uh, unavoidable. Yeah, it's obvious, but uh, that's the real change that we were talking about when this project is coming from, uh, from, uh, from the locals and it gets that sort of recognition, then we can really start talking about, about that change. Yes. Well, I think if there are no further questions, um, I'm going to hand this over to Roger Cohen. Um, is it your next? Yeah.